The first bad thing that happened was that Jamie Marks disappeared in late September. One day he sat next to me in the computer lab, and the next day his seat was empty. The last time I saw him, I was running home from cross-country practice. The Marks house was on my way back. It sat down from the road in a hollow, gray and ashy, surrounded by maple trees and weeping willows. Red and orange leaves littered the front yard, and a small gray shed stood off to the side of the house with the nose of a tractor poking out. Four dog coops sat in the yard, one at each corner, two under the trees near the road, two under the trees near the house, and the dogs themselves ran back and forth on chains tied to the trees, patrolling. A long drive curled down the hill from the road, back to the shed. The drive was really just tire ruts from where Mr. Marks drove an 18-wheeler up and down the lawn from the road. He drove for a company in Youngstown, an hour away from here, and hardly anyone in town ever saw him. Whenever I ran past the Marks house, I couldn't help but look at the window over the kitchen to see if Jamie was there. I'd seen him there the previous spring on a day soon after my grandma died, watching me run. So after that, whenever I ran past, I'd look to see if he was watching. The dogs barked angrily as I passed, but Jamie wasn't in the window on the last day I saw him. He came rocking up the rutted drive in his Boy Scout uniform to get the mail instead. I waved and he waved back like we were friends, and I guess we were sort of, but not really, not yet. I thought about asking why he was a Boy Scout, but I kept running instead. Then he suddenly shouted, looking good, McCormick, and stopped me in my tracks. I kept lifting my knees up, going nowhere. While well, he came to the mailbox, flipped the lid up and pulled out the usual stack of grocery store coupons and have you seen me postcards and pictures of missing kids on them. He looked up and then, he, he looked up then and I'll always remember this, said, nothing ever comes that's worth anything anyway. He said this as if he'd been expecting better, as if something that would change the world as soon as he opened the envelope was supposed to arrive that day. I didn't say anything. I was satisfied watching him sort mail. Looking at his uniform and the round glasses sliding down his nose, I wondered if maybe the glasses didn't have something to do with his nickname. I never did ask, though. Sometimes you regret things like that. Sometimes you regret not asking simple questions. The uniform looked strange on him, but maybe only because I'd never joined the Boy Scouts. I tried picturing him wearing my clothes instead, but when I opened my mouth, I said, that's a cool uniform. He was as surprised by the compliment as I was, but he managed to say thanks, even though it was obvious he didn't believe me. He asked what I thought about the program we learned in computer lab that day, and I said, it's okay, but I wouldn't have understood without your help. He shrugged like it was just this thing he did without any trouble, and suddenly I found myself asking if he was going to the homecoming dance in October. No way, he said. That's for cheerleaders and jocks. As soon as he said it, he looked down at his feet to hide his embarrassment, but I could still see him grinning. Sorry, he said. I didn't mean you. I shrugged like he'd shrugged off my compliment and told him not to include me with the rest of them. I run, I said, but I run for myself. I can respect that, said Jamie. Then he looked up and down the road as if he expected someone, and the last thing he said before he took the mail in was, I have to go to a Boy Scout meeting in a while, but give me a call sometime. The next day his seat was empty, and two days later the whole town started looking for him. I joined in on the search, hoping I'd find him somewhere safe and sound, just hiding maybe, for whatever reason, but it was Gracie Highsmith, a girl in my class who found his body two weeks later. It was on that day, the day Gracie Highsmith found Jamie's body, that God's finger descended on my family. It was October, the reaping season, my grandma called it. For days, the sky was black with storms, but no rain had fallen. When I look back now, I don't know why I hadn't seen it coming. I saw things the same way as my grandma, and having that should have been enough to know what was coming. I could count crows. I knew the difference between dreaming and seeing the future. And I always took a different route than the one I'd been on if for some reason I had to turn around and go home. I knew that when a sparrow sang, a spirit was coming down from heaven. And I knew that ghosts always surround us, whether we're able to see them or not. Don't talk to them too much, my grandma always warned me. They can be nice, but in the end, they're always jealous creatures. So when all of this started, when my family was picked out for sadness, I was sitting in my bedroom playing a video game called Nevermorrow. I played a character who was a knight with a sword and shield. He was trapped in the nine layers of hell and had to kill all sorts of undead monsters to find his way out to the land of the living. While I hacked skeletons to pieces, my parents were out in the living room, yelling at each other. It didn't really mean anything to me then. My parents had been fighting about one thing or another since I could remember. Usually it was about money or who did more or who was smarter. Sometimes my dad would lose his job and when that happened, my mom and he would scream their full heads off. His excuse was that construction work was seasonal, but my mother 
<clears throat> but there were other men my mother could name without pausing who never got laid off. My dad was a drinking man. Sometimes my mom was a drinker too. Usually my dad drank when he lost work, then he and my mom would fight, and then she'd start drinking and then fight even worse. They'd eventually give up after a while and things would return to normal, or as close to normal as we could get. My brother and I never got into the arguments. We figured it was grown-up stuff and that it'd all be fine in the end. But that day, my father told my mother she was a waste. And that's when the second bad thing began to come into being. My dad said, you are such a waste, Linda. And my mom said, oh yeah? You think so? Well, we'll just see about that. Then she got into her car and pulled out of our driveway, throwing gravel in every direction as she pushed down on the gas. She was going to Abel's, or so she said, where she would have a beer and find herself a real man. When I look back on it now, I can see the holes they were making. I can see how, with each nasty thing they said, they were attracting misfortune, making doorways for darkness to come into our lives. So when the second bad thing arrived, it shouldn't have been a surprise, but at the time I didn't understand how it could have happened. When my mother was halfway to Abel's, she got in a head-on collision with a drunk woman named Lucy, who was on her way home from Abel's just then. They were both driving around that blind curve on Highway 88, Lucy swerving a little, my mother smoking her cigarette, not even caring where the ashes fell. When they leaned their cars into the curve, Lucy crossed into my mother's lane and bam, just like that, they collided. My mother's car rolled three times into the ditch and Lucy's car careened into a guardrail. It was Lucy who called the ambulance on her cellular phone, saying over and over, My God, I think I've killed Linda McCormick. Oh my God, I've killed that poor girl. At that same moment, Gracie Highsmith was becoming famous. While my mother and Lucy Hall were on their way to crashing into one another, Gracie was walking the old defunct railroad tracks that ran through town, through the woods and through the covered bridge that spanned Sugar Creek. She was a rock collector and had gone out that day after school to find something special, some quartz or a strangely shaped piece of coal or nickel, an arrowhead or one of the blue glass insulators that sometimes fell off power lines. What she found when she lifted a rock from the rail bed, though, was a blue eye staring back at her. At that very moment, two screams filled the air. One was the scream of Gracie Highsmith. Her scream erupted somewhere deep in her chest in a place she never knew existed. The scream grew big before it could make its way out. It spread through her heart and lungs until it filled up her throat and poured from her mouth like a fountain of horror. The second scream was my mother's. While the car spun in the air, while it turned over and over, throwing her unbelted body against the steering wheel, cracking her head against the window, her scream pierced the evening quiet along with Gracie's, shattering the windshield, spattering it with blood. The scream filled the air until the car came to a rest on the passenger side. Then everything went dark, and the only thing she heard was a ticking noise and the sound of footsteps coming toward her. The last thing she saw was Lucy Hall walking around outside the wreckage, peering through the windshield between cupped hands, shouting, I'm so sorry, my God, please forgive me. And beneath the layers of dirt and gravel, beneath the rusty rails and rotten ties, Jamie Marks slipped out of his body. He was found now, and having been found, he could begin to live again.